You can help us at History Hack by joining us via Patreon. It takes quite a lot of effort and a lot of work of quite a big team now to keep us going. And so if you could donate as little as £3 a month, it would be massively appreciated by all of us. There's different levels because Princess Marcus has set it all up with uh, varying rewards and things. So do have a look, do join us. There's uh, an exclusive Facebook group as well and you can be part of all of it. Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. We're very excited this evening because we have a returning guest and someone we like very, very much. Charlie, you're with me today. How Hello. You, and who have we got with us? We have got an author and presenter of the Haunted Histories podcast. We've got Penny Griffiths Morgan with us. Thank you so much for joining us, Penny. Well, thank you, guys. I've been looking forward to doing this. Oh, us too, us too. It's taken a while to get it together, hasn't it? So we're going to talk about your new book. Yes. Um, But before we do that, tell them what, for you, because I think there's some variations, isn't there? So for you, what does paranormal history entail? Because that's your speciality. It is, yeah. Um, I could do this over two minutes. I could do it over 20. But um, (laughs) if I take the two separately... Mm -hmm. paranormal is anything you can't really explain logically so paranormal means not normal the history side is the fact that people who are into the paranormal are always looking at ways to validate or debunk um and and if you're listening this you won't see me do this but in speech commas the evidence that they find from the history side i like to come in and explain what would have been happening at that point in history if they found something that's got historical relevance also using my knowledge of history maybe to do the research for them so if they come up with a name say a name that was associated with um ref tibbenham for example like i had in my second book i will then find and see if i can find those flight records see if i can find who that person was see if i can find the backstory for them Um, and then it's all about sort of setting the scene in places and letting them understand quite what would have been going on in that time so that when you're doing an investigation when you target it properly for example I'll give you an example if you use the word TB in a Victorian setting if there is a ghost they may not understand what you mean by TB so simplistically you would say consumption do you get what I mean so even though it can go as simple as that or it can go as broad as giving people an hour-long talk about I don't know the Victorian workhouse so that then they can come up with things that are are, are applicable to the Victorian workhouse to then use to investigate with. So it kind of covers everything. But one of the main things is it's it's finding evidence for people. And when you do get a name come up through a device, like a random name, and then you find out the information they've given you ties into, say, a a soldier who fought in the trenches or or something else, it's quite mind-blowing. And especially as a historian, because it does almost feel like somebody from the past is talking to me to tell me something I need to know. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, really interesting stuff. Do you think sometimes that a, a little bit of knowledge of history affects people's um, interaction with the paranormal? So, for example, people hear a screaming woman at Hampton Court and automatically assume that that's the one that they've heard of. Funnily enough, we were talking about this before we start recording, weren't we? Yeah, it was seamless how I brought it in. I was very impressed. Same in the reincarnation stuff, isn't it? Nobody's Mm. ever the reincarnation of a peasant. (laughs) Nefertiti. (laughs) Yeah, um, no, I agree. I mean, that's a whole different... Yeah, let's not touch that level of... uh, Um, Reincarnation and old head on young shoulders and all that stuff. Um, Yes, Yes, people don't. One of the biggest problems with some people in the paranormal, I won't say all, because I say some, they don't research. They take it at face value what they've discovered. So, for example, um, the book we're going to be talking about, um, somebody said that the guy who lived in the master's house told them he had three children. And they went, oh, did he? Oh, I was actually, no, he had five but he could have been talking about there was only three living there at that point, you know. So it's it's rather than holding it, and they knew that he had at some he had children, so they assumed it was the right number. That's a simple one. Um, but like you say about 
people automatically assume it's one specific person in history because they've heard her story that when we talk about Catherine Howard, she, the fact that when she heard that, say, Henry wasn't too happy with her, she ran screaming down the corridor. Mm-hmm. I suppose she got away from her jailers, didn't she, after yeah. she'd been sentenced to death. And, and she ran to his private... Uh, that has the uh, balcony entrance yeah. for the King's Chapel, and he was yeah. crying and she was banging on the door. That's right. And so people automatically assume if they hear a screaming woman, it's got to be her. Now, it could be. It could be. But what I would come in and do is say, well, about all the other people, it doesn't have to be the king or the queen or the princess that's doing the haunting. It could be one of the, the lady in waitings. It could be a serving girl. It could be. And, and, and yes, so having a little bit of knowledge, whilst it's good to make you start thinking things through, people do tend to, to, to jump. Some people tend to mm-hmm. jump to conclusions. So you are a believer. Mm-hmm. When you're conducting paranormal investigations, what yeah. is actually involved and how do you determine whether something is worthy of your time in terms of doing the historical research or whether it's just nonsense and you leave it alone? Ha, huh. that's a really good question. <laughs> I don't know if it's a simple answer. Um, doing the investigations, there are so many different ways you can do them. You can do them what I would call old school with a psychic medium, seeing what they pick up. Or you can start using some of the sort of modern gadgets that people use or everything in between. So, um, you know, for example, people, a lot of people say they feel a breeze on their face and they think that's a spirit passing by them. Well, the first thing I'm doing is holding a piece of like a thin piece of paper up and seeing if the paper's flapping, because if the paper's flapping, there is a draft coming in, you know, little things like that. Um, If someone says that they've got a temp, there's a temperature fluctuation you set a thermometer up, like an electronic thermometer, to see if there is a temperature fluctuation. And if there is, one of the things I tend to do then, is there a venting type bra- a brick in, in around the bottom of the building that could be causing that cold spot? So you've got all those kind of things that you want to do. I tend to find that certain places, and I'm not a medium, but I pick up on things, you might feel a bit of a weird, you might suddenly get an image in your head. I said, I can explain this. And I did it once when I was at Fort Horstead down in uh, Kent, isn't it? Fort Horstead. And the psychic medium was picking up on this, this soldier. And I was seeing a picture of a soldier in my head and, and we were almost both describing him at the same time, exactly the same. And he was saying, I can't work out if he's World War One or World War Two. He was one. And, and, and I sort of said, well, his uniform, because uh, he had, I don't know what they're called. You know, the, is it the, um, the, the things they wear on their legs? In World War I, they were bandages, weren't they? And then in World War II, they were almost sort of... Stu- oh, the putties. Thank you, yes. But the ones I was seeing were bandages. Uh, and then I saw this gun in my head, like a big field-type gun. And I said, I said... I think he's showing us World War One, and I did go and look him up, and it it, it was a, an officer who had been a sort of lower ranking officer in World War One, but because he was quite young, he actually survived and ended up being a higher ranking sort of desk bound officer in World War Two, and I found him, and he, I found this guy who was linked to Horstead. Um, I don't know for definite that it was him, but the pieces fit, mm. if you like. and the photo I found of him, the medium did say. I because I get what I tend to do with people I'm a bit naughty I'll give them three or four photos and say who is it you saw and he picked the right one so possibly but it, it sometimes I just it depends how much information there is for me to go on if if it's just oh this was a person who lived in the 1800s not really but if if they get if you say a first name and a rough date that they feel they were there of a place you can then normally use census records and things to see if that person really did exist. So what I do, some, sometimes I will just look things up for people just to sort of give them an idea. But other times there has to be enough information for me not to be on a wild goose chase. Because mm. as you know, when you're doing historical research, it can be sometimes like a knee in the knee, needle in the biggest blooming haystack. Yeah. Well, I thought you were going to say a knee in the crotch. I was like, yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. That too, like, <laughs> uh, when you find the evidence out, people go, "Nah, you're wrong," and you're like, <laughs> "That's the new crotch." Um, but yes, but so it, it really depends on what the information is that people are coming through with, um, how ambiguous it is, and 
you know, whether they've questioned the what they're getting, if that makes sense. If they're not questioning it, then, but sometimes sometimes it's just the, the, the information you're getting is just like, nah, this doesn't seem right. I look it up just out of curiosity and something goes, comes back and absolutely slaps me in the face. It's so accurate. So yeah, it's, it's really the amount of information. And with me, sometimes it's just a gut feeling that I need to take this further. Yeah. I guess you can't take it too much for granted because everything can sound a little bit crazy and off and you oh, get into it. Sounds it sounds completely batty at times the way I talk, but um, <laughs> no, what, what, what people don't see is the hours and hours and hours of debunking that I will try yeah. to do. You know, nobody wants to, when you, when you write a book, nobody wants to read about all the stuff you do to try and see if it's real or not, or if you can find a pl- pl- plausible explanation people don't want to know that it's a bit like with the television shows like your ghost adventures and dare I say most haunted and stuff nobody wants to know that they've spent nine ten hours for 20 minutes worth of footage mm. I know that they want to think that's the minute that you know the minute you walk into that building stuff's being thrown at you and it's not like that <laughs> if only unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> so a big part of the job is actually trying to disprove your own theories yes. I think you should be I, I think if you're an investigator and a researcher you you need to you know if you if you just accept it at face value how can you argue it when someone says ah but Mm. it's like with history research isn't it if you come up with a a, um i was talking to david o'keefe recently the dieppe and he was saying the amount of people that go ah but and he says yeah well what about this what about this what he said i've gone down every single avenue to see which is plausible and i think you've got to do that because then it does create a solid foundation if people do want to try and argue it with you that's fantastic I think yeah we could all we could all uh, put that on a t-shirt that sounds fantastic um <laughs> so let's talk about your latest book mm-hmm. paranormal playtime the school that never sleeps that's the one you you kicked off writing that with a very specific aim in mind um can you tell us about what you were hoping would come from writing and researching this book well, every, uh, everything I do, the aim is pretty much the same. It's to give people tools to ask questions. I, when I do the history stuff, someone who was specialising in just that would add a lot more detail. But what I want to do is I want the history sort of fans to know that not everyone in the paranormal is like, woo <laughs> we have some logic to us but I want the people in the paranormal to realize that history isn't you know your boring tweed jacket leather elbows nah, 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 sort of thing <laughs> we're laughing because actually you're describing Marcus but he's not- <laughs> what's brilliant is that he cultivates that with passion to get there okay that, that's probably the bit I didn't explain yeah <laughs> not even an insult <laughs> one of my history teachers at school that's how he looked he had he was only probably about 30 but he looked about 60 and <laughs> he loved his subject but he would talk like this and mention dates and I used to fall asleep in his class because there was just no he obviously enjoyed but he didn't have any kind of mm, about it it wasn't huh? and 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 it wasn't he didn't dress like that to be ironic if you know what I mean he dressed like that because that's how he dressed and 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 you know but the best history teacher I ever had was one who would literally be running around the classroom explaining stuff to us and was so excited to be able to talk to us you couldn't help I mean some of the kids thought he was nuts but I used to think wow you can't you feed off that Mm. enthusiasm which is what I want to do when I talk history whether it's to my son's class when I did a world war ii presentation to them last year whether it's to, um, I did a, a presentation on the air transport auxiliary recently to a load of people. I, I want them to hear the excitement that I'm getting being able to talk about this. And that's, so I, that's what I'm trying to do is to, to, to get the two sides to meet. So let's do that. The building <laughs> we're looking at is currently the British Schools Museum yes. in Kitchen. Yes. But naturally, because it would make sense, before it was a museum, it was a school. So tell it us was. a bit about the history of it and what leads people to think it's haunted. Okay, or oh, oh, this is why I get pa- I get passionate. Mm-hmm. People, um, but obviously, talking history, um, if you're listening to this and you already know this, I do apologise if I'm teaching you how to suck eggs, but education cost a lot of money back in the days. So before about, well, it was, it was about, um, let me think, I think it was about 1870 that... 
there was a people started being expected to have an education, but they were still cost money. And so when you've got people who are earning basically nothing, you know, they are not even living hand to mouth in our sort of, but they are literally living hand to mouth. They have only one pair of shoes for five kids, you know, that kind of thing. Their kid not being able to work and them having to spend, say, a shilling a week on education, they haven't got it. So kids didn't learn. And one of uh, around these early 1800s, there was a few movements who were starting to realize that, you know, if we actually teach these kids, if we teach them just a basic, the basic being able to read and write, they're going to be able to get them to start pulling themselves out of that poverty trap. They're going to be able to start doing a slightly better well-paid job and, and, and all of this. And one of those people was a guy called Joseph Lancaster. And he was a Quaker. Um, and he, he, he learned to be a teacher and then decided to start teaching kids for free in his parents, in effect, front room. And he pioneered something called the Lancaster, Lancasterian method, which also is known as the monitorial method. So his, his theory was, well, one of the most expensive, there's two real expenses in teaching, paper and staff. And he said, is there a way we can teach lots and lots of kids without those costs? And so he came up with a monitorial method where you could have like 60 or 70 kids, one teacher, but then for every sort of 10 kids, there would be what they'd call a pupil monitor who, who was, who's, who'd sort of gone up the, the grades, if you like, and was able to supervise whatever row they were responsible for. And he also started to work on ways of not having to use paper. So, for example, when kids were first learning how to form a number or a letter, they would use a tray of sand. From the sand, they would go up to slate and chalk. It was only when they were totally competent with, with the slate side of things, slate and chalk, that they would then get given a pen and paper to start practicing with. So it was a way of reducing the costs, obviously, you know, recycling stuff and everything else. And, and then with books, there would only ever be two in copies of a book. So you would have the copy that the teacher had. And then what they would do is they would have the pages around the room. And if your group was learning from that page, you would be sent over there with your group, with your monitor, who would then, you would read from the page on the wall. So it started to save money. Now, it, this took off. He, his ideas were really, you know, popular. Um, and it was also a few years later that the, uh, and the national schools movement started under uh, something called the Madras Method with Dr. Andrew Bell, which is very, very similar to Lancaster's. And there is quite a lot of competition between the two as okay. to who came with it first. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I'm pro-Joseph. I have to say I'm pro-Lancaster for obvious reasons because I've <laughs> written about him. But there is a bit of competition between who, who came, but they both were doing it for the right reasons. It was to educate, whereas national schools were um, Church of England schools. So if you see a Church of England um, C of E school, a lot of those started off as national schools and would have been in the villages and things. Mm. Whereas what Lancaster was doing was non-denominational. And was, it was, that, that was quite an important thing because they didn't, but you know, whereas Sunday schools were Robert Rakes 50 years ago, they had expected kids to, to literally just learn to read the Bible. And that was it. They weren't expected to actually what I call learn. It was more just reciting the Bible and then learning catches and that kind of thing. Um, the other thing with Lancaster is he didn't believe in the kind of corporal punishment that people like Robert Rakes. I mean, Robert Rakes was very much a, you know, was it spare the rod, spoil the child type person. Lancaster believed in you didn't need to to beat the living daylights out of a child to get them to work if you actually made them look stupid to their friends they're more likely to pull their weight because they don't want to look stupid and he also believed in like the reward system like reward them for doing something well it doesn't mean necessarily they're the best student but if you know you've got a child who's 10 years old and whose parents if he doesn't or she doesn't go out to work the parents will only be able to eat meat once a week yet that child is making the effort to come to school every single day yeah reward them for that with a token or, or in some cases eat when they got really sort of the money was a bit more fluid, they were given a, get given a book as a present, as a reward. So his whole method of teaching was very, very different to what people, and it was very, very low cost. And in some cases he didn't charge, which is why um, he didn't, he, he kind of, <laughs> he was bankrupt on more than one occasion. Ah. <laughs> he did actually spend time in fleet on, on the debtors prison. 
on more than one occasion because he wasn't very good with money. Great teacher, not a great manager. Back in about, I think it was 1808, um, a local person in Hitchin, a local businessman called William Wilshire, he actually saw Lancaster talk about the benefits because Lancaster was very good at PR. He was traveling all over the UK promoting this type of education. And he was very impressed. And so he donated a maltings, um, an old maltings that he was responsible for to the Lancasterian group, the Royal Lancasterian Society, to turn into a school. Mm-hmm. And so that's when the Hitching School first, it was actually 1810 that it first opened under the Lancasterian method of teaching to provide teaching to low cost teaching, low cost education to those people who couldn't afford it any other way. So that was how the school started. Right. So what what about it makes us think it's haunted now, this building? Well, this is, this is when it gets a bit sort of um, theoretical. One of the theories is that places where children have been um, creates a lot of energy. And in sort of the paranormal kind of conversations, there is something called stone tape theory. And stone tape theory is that the, the, the atmosphere, if you like, absorbs events. I always say it's a bit like um, having a Groundhog Day with a video, yeah. that the same video just loops over and over again. And that's called a residual haunting. And they, they, they believe this stone tape theory thing that the, the atmosphere absorbs something that had a lot of energy associated with it that then loops over and over again. So that is Catherine Howard running down the gallery at Hampton Court. Obviously the energy she would have been expelling at that point where she's about to be executed. Right. It, it could be the kind of energy that gets absorbed into it. So they, and because children do have that kind of innocent, I say innocent, mine aren't always innocent. <laughs> but you know what I mean? They, they do have that kind of pure, unadulterated energy about them. Um, and the fact that for a lot of these children, it was a lot safer for them to be in these schools than at home. When you, you, you read about a lot of the children at Hitching, for example, they have doing what we call the yards. And the yards were these, and Hitching, uh, the school is in the very, what was the very poor part of Hitching. It was originally on Dead Street, and that's what the road was called, Dead Street. Um, and these yards were like, they were horrendous. You'd, you'd have, I think I worked out in one street that had some like 20, 24 houses. There was over 89 people living in them. Wow. So, you know, for these children to come into school, they would be a lot safer and less, less likely to be abused, less likely to be, you know, have to work 15, 16 hours a day. It was a nicer life for them. So it was a happy place for them to go back to, which is another reason why they think it could be haunted. That there's no sort of major deaths been listed, you know, no horrific events or anything like that. There is a, there was a death in the master's house. Um, the actual master who lived there, he died there, he retired and he he was he died in, in the actual house. But that I have found some of the children who went, they did die quite young once they'd left school at 13. So it could be they're going back there because it was their happy place. They liked it there. They had attention. They they were treated like children. And that much energy, as you say, mm. gets gets trapped and gets stuck. Is this the same sort of thing that, that gets reported along ley lines? It's similar. Ley lines, yeah, ley lines are meant to be almost like a magnetic attractor to things. It, it's similar to um, places that got a high qu- contents of uh, quartz in the earth is meant to have a lot of paranormal activity. Um, And I say, they're all theories as to why these things happen. I mean, I think it's, um, I'm sure it's Glastonbury that's meant to be on the point of crossing of two of the most powerful ley lines that there is. Um, But you don't actually hear that many hauntings at Glastonbury, just that it's a very pagan spiritual place. But yeah, ley lines are meant to be almost like a sort of a magnetic attractor for things same as like say anything limestone that has a high content of quartz in um another one that's meant to be and and this could probably apply to hitching because as it is a very very old town it dates back to saxon if not before and they would build on a river or hitching has a river running through that the hitch it's about h-i-c i believe pronounce hitch and there are theories that water is a conductor of spiritual activity as well and but also manages to trap whatever it's around so you nobody really knows but Hitchin has got 
a lot of paranormal stuff associated with it which doesn't really surprise me because the age of the place and and the amount of different eras and sort of history it's it's seen um but yeah the school my, my theory on why the school is the way it is it's because of the children in there and the energy that those children if anyone heard screaming then it was my son having a tantrum downstairs <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good as i'm saying about children's energy perfect I guess. Yeah. Downstairs, it's like well done son um it, it, it's kind of yeah it's the, just the sheer innocent energy that they would have brought to the place has kind of almost acts like a battery pack to it because some places i've visited you know you you feel quite it feels quite oppressive inside it feels like it really doesn't want you there the school it feels like coming home whenever I go there I, I it's one of the buildings I would quite happily be left there on my own at three o'clock in the morning I don't feel uh it's intimidating at all it's quite pleased to have you there if, if that is, sounds yeah. completely mad but no, it doesn't at all so it's a good energy it's a good yeah, vibe I, I, think so. I think so I think so so how does it how did this does this energy manifest itself at this school then <sighs> Um, there's, I mean, I experienced this. There's lots of reports of hearing children laughing, giggling. Um, um, the where I mentioned about them writing in the sand, they actually have it. There, there is actually what's called the Lancasterian classroom. It's called or the hall, as it's known. And for anyone listening who is a teacher, this could hold up to 300 children with just one school teacher. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I, when I told one of my son's teachers that, he went very, very pale and went pass. Um, but so, and and there's been cases where you know we've we've been sitting there in the room, nobody else is in. It's a huge hall. Mm. I've got pictures of it on my website and everything else. Um, and we'll be sitting at one end, and we've cleared the sand tray at the front and gone back and seen a letter's been written in it, and there's been nobody in there. So things like that, like quite mischievous things. We've had um, desks slam open and shut before um my favorite one in one of the the what's called the gallery classroom like the more sort of victorian type one you think of on on steps yeah i was there doing an investigation and I, we did hear footsteps outside and went running out nobody there and it was distinct footsteps but i was kind of because you're trying not to make a noise because everyone you know minute someone hears a creak they're like ah and you're trying so you try not to make a noise and i remember i was leaning on the desk and these desks are bolted down leaning on the desk and and the desk literally jumped underneath me it was like it suddenly had an electric shock go through it it was so weird and I sort of went ah and slipped but this desk moved I'm and and I can't I I tried debunking I tried replicating it nobody else was moving I tried getting somebody to run up and down next to my desk jump in front of it I even looked to see I I went up with a, a, a cable detector see if there's any electric cables running underneath it or any pipes that could have expanded nothing um this desk jumped underneath my arms so i think a lot of the activity that the kids do is quite mischievous yeah like kids would be because you know and and sometimes you do have to kind of say to them you're not going to get in trouble if you do something you are allowed to be a bit cheeky and you do have to it's almost like once you keep saying to them you, you can be a bit cheeky you can um we had one case there where there was the girl, we put the girl, we did what's called a trigger. And so with a trigger, you kind of are trying to replicate something that would make them, they would understand. So we got a girl to sit in the corner with a dunce's hat on. <laughs> now, I'm not a fan of the dunce's hat. I think it was a horrible thing, but you know, back then it was one of the tamer punishments, I suppose. And we said to the spirits, come on, if you're here, push that hat off. And they did. We saw it. We, if you can imagine, it's, got, it's like a paper dunce's hat. We saw the girl wasn't moving. We got it on camera. We saw the hat like dent slightly and start moving, whereas if someone was pushing it, huh. with their hands. So most of the stuff you get there, if it's if it's what we call interactive, it's very naughty, it's cheeky, it's kids being kids. Gosh. So you say that you you filmed that, you caught it on camera. There's a part of me that's that's listening to to your stories, and I've I've come out here. I'm an absolute believer but I've never seen anything I've never yeah. never experienced anything other than you need to come out with me girl exactly so so when you go out on these kind of these investigations what are you hoping to achieve you hope do you record are you how is it kind of I think I'm, I'm asking how do you quantify the experience hmm. I never expect anything you know to, to me 
the opportunity to get to these beautiful old buildings with I don't have the children with me telling me they're bored I don't have other people sort of getting in the way when you're trying to just sit there and you know when you just sit in a room and just listen to the room do you know mm. what I'm talking about when you just sit somewhere yeah. and you just absorb I can yeah, do what are your kids 10 and 12 that don't happen <laughs> <laughs> well one you heard screaming he's eight on Friday okay, so then. happy birthday to him this Friday yeah. the other 12 who you've met Alex online he's 12 yeah. next month so no no you don't get <laughs> peace and quiet um but you know but even if you go as adults and you've got other people in a museum or an old building looking around you get people who don't want to be there mm-hmm. and it's but when you get a group of people who are investigating, everyone wants to be there. Everyone. And so I can tell you to a, a sort of a group, if they've hired somewhere, look, I'm just going to wander off to that room over there, shut the door and just sit mm. for hours. And nobody thinks you're weird, which is always a good thing. Nobody will interrupt. And you can just absorb and think and, and learn about the place which is 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 what that's my objective when I go somewhere is to learn something whether that be paranormal whether it be historical or whether it just be what I'm capable of Mm. um when something does happen the first thing I will do well I do tend to write everything down because otherwise you forget all the little bits sometimes when I go back through my investigation notes I'm like I didn't remember that happening at that point wow so yes I document everything um using voice recorders a lot when you you do what's called a electronic voice phenomenon session evp session when you're asking questions and hoping to get a reply all that kind of thing i don't always film everything because sometimes the people you go with don't want to be filmed um but there's normally i'm normally writing stuff down as it's happening so i don't forget because then i'm going to try and debunk it so with the desk jumping up at the time i tried to debunk it couldn't i went back a few days later in daylight with the the museum curator and we went through the blueprint we went through everything that could have gone on in that room to yeah. try and debunk it and couldn't so but that one experience and that wasn't the best one i had at that place that night that one experience would make your whole night you don't need to have stuff happening every fight that is enough to make you go that has blown my mind i don't know why that happened so to answer your question, I go. I don't go in with any expectations. If anything happens, it's a bonus. Um, but it's rare that something doesn't happen if you just sit and listen. If you don't, you don't need to make it happen. Um, I sound really cuckoo now, but there's normally someone who wants to tell you something if you're just a patient and you're that kind of person. I find you, if you're the kind of person that complete strangers come and talk to you at at the bus stop, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> you do good on this. See, Charlie would be great with you, I think. My millennial attention span would be just buggered after 10 minutes. I've <laughs> I think I'd, I would put them off. Um, you've talked about, when we were preparing this episode, Hitchin and how old it is. You've mentioned mm. that already. Um, are they linked, any of these stories? Because you said that there's other buildings, aren't there, and other sites in Hitchin. Is any of this linked together or is it just a general aura of sort of out there activity? Well, until I started researching, okay, until I started, originally the book was going to be just on the school. Um, but... They, they had wanted me to get it written and produce, uh, uh, published for this year because it's this the school's 25th anniversary of being a museum. And it takes me about a year to write one of these with investigations, with research, getting into records offices. It, it, it's not just a case of, I just, I do actually do my research. <laughs> Obviously last year, March, I just started writing this had about five investigations planned to do at the school, had, um, uh, uh, I was due to be going to Bruno University where the the British and Foreign School Society archives are kept, all that stuff, COVID. Mm. Uh. (laughs) So that's why I thought, well, I need to find stuff because they need the book done for this year. Don't know how long COVID is going to last. So I started having to think laterally. And that's why I did put a few bits in about other parts of the 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 the, the, the town that people. And that's when I started thinking, blimey, this place for a small place, it's got a hell of a lot going on. Um, I did look into the ground composition to see if it was the quartz thing I mentioned earlier, and I couldn't find any confirmation of that. 
Um, I think it's it is just down to well it's just down to the the difference in people that have lived there and the things that have happened it, it has been a, i mean hertfordshire in general some old ones especially has had quite a lot of religious connotations which can sometimes give rise to ghost stories because of everyone wants to see the, the monk the black monk or whatever um i also know that you know you did have quite a lot of battles the english civil war took place nearby came through you had highwaymen come through so there would have been a lot of quite antagonistic energies going on um i i don't know why it's got the activity levels it has in if i'm honest and and i've spoken to other people who've investigated different parts of kitchen they don't know why either it just seems to, to, to be the case but it, it could just be down to the fact that it has been around for sort of thousands of years so there's a lot of things that have just built up in general um I am hoping to get to investigate the Priory and the Sun Hotel, which I mentioned in there at some point. But, you know, places are only just starting to be reopened to investigations now and they're still a bit sort of scared of allowing groups of people in. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 I'll be honest, if I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why it's the way it is. I think it could just be down to the age and the fact that so many different things mm. have happened there. And possibly the river could be to do with it as well. That's so interesting. I'm in Bedford, so I'm only up the road. So ah, we'll, yes. uh, we'll definitely come and uh, come and hunt some stuff around Hitchin cool. with you. So you you touched on very. It was very tantalising, and it just it sort of it it came and it went as quickly as it as it came from <laughs> your mouth. You said that the desk at the school that jumped yeah, yeah. under you was not the most exciting thing that happened to you at the school. Can you tell us or do we have to buy the book? Because I really no. want to know. I'm not going to tell you anything else apart from this story. If you want to okay. learn anything else I experienced at school, you've got to buy All right. the book. One more. That's fair. That's fair, isn't it? <laughs> right. So um, the group I was investigating with, we'd gone out for a meal just up the road beforehand. Like we, I mean, when you're going to be on your feet for seven, eight hours, you need to have some food beforehand. Um, and they'd gone off in their cars. I didn't really know where I was going. So I was following my sat nav, didn't realize I could park at the school. So I'd parked in a pay and display just up the road that, that was free, but it was a, a public car park. And so I'm walking up to the school to try and find everyone. Couldn't hear any sort of voices or anyone talking. There was no one in the car. So I'm like, oh God, I'm just gonna have to try doors, aren't I, to see? And as you, as you, if you look at a picture of the front, you've got, if you're looking at the front of it, you've got like the school building on your left and then these two houses on your right. Okay. And then there's gates and the gates lead into the school playground. Well, I'm thinking, well, those houses look like offices and it said school, uh, like British Schools Museum or something on the door. And I thought those houses look like offices. Maybe they're in there. Maybe there's like a function room in there that they're all sitting in or something. And as I looked at the wind this window, I saw a woman... And I can't think how to describe her hair other than it was in that sort of Edwardian Pompadour style that the women mm. wear. And I could see her through the window and she's bending over a desk. And so I thought, okay, it's just someone who likes to wear their hair a bit different. They must be in there. And so I tried the big front door and it opened. And I walked in, I sort of, so I tried, and I tried the door to my right. That was unlocked tried the door to my left where I'd seen this woman it was open and unlocked and I opened it and walked straight in there's no one there I suddenly realized I'm in a private office so sort of being a bit bonkers I was like I'm sorry sorry thinking if anyone's in there they'd hear me apologize and made my way out and then went into the main school building to look and chatting to the museum manager afterwards I said oh mate you need to know that door that's right by the road is unlocked into your offices and your offices are open and he went no they're not and I went, they are, I've just been in there, they're, they're open. And he said, they're not, I locked them before I came out. And he said, and the office you're talking about, you went into is one of those keypad ones, it locks automatically when the door was shut. Was the door shut? And I went, yeah, I just turned the handle and opened it. And he goes, we never use that front door, that front door's always locked. And I went, well, it opened. And, and I said about seeing the woman in the window and he goes, I'm the only person on duty tonight. There's nobody else in there, it's all locked. And so we went over there and this was probably about 15, 20 minutes after it happened. And no, none of the public had arrived by this point to do the public side of it. It was just us. 
and yeah, big front door locked, can't get into it, locked completely. Now it hadn't dropped a latch when I pulled it. I just pulled it too. He unlocked it for me and we went in and yet the office I'd gone into locked. And he said, this is what, and he, he did the keypad thing. He said, it's an automatic thing. And he showed me two or three times it was an automatic one. It locked when you shut the door. It was only afterwards that I found out that that house had actually been the schoolmistress's house. And I'd seen a woman with her hair up in like a bun, sort of Edwardian style bun in the window, leaning over. Wow. Now, I didn't get photos of it. People can believe me if they want to, but it kind of, the, those doors unlocked for me so I could go in. The debunking of that must have been really fun. You know, has he, did did the man who works in the office have a fancy woman who liked to dress up in Edwardian style hiding in the cupboard? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> didn't actually ask him that, but he, he was, he was as kind of as stunned as I was. Yeah. Because he, because the, this door to this is right next to the road, so you wouldn't want to leave it unlocked because it's it's the offices, it's where they would keep all the sort of important stuff. And he he knowing him, he was quite fastidious about locking things up, and it was locked when I went back there 15, 20 minutes later, and nobody else had appeared, uh, nobody else had been at that point. He was the only staff member on who would have had keys. That's so nice. that was my most kind. That still for, for the school is my <gasps> moment that it kind of almost was like that as soon as I walked on the premise, they wanted me to write about them. Mm. That That's the only way I can think of. But I did try, I did say, when we I went back and the door was locked and I couldn't get in. And then when I found out it's where the schoolmistress had lived, that kind of thing, tallies. Yeah, they, they, they have said I can go back and do more investigations, but actually in that part of the building, if I want to, because um, it's not open to the general public, obviously. But yeah. Uh, yeah going forwards that they have said I can sort of literally spend the day in there night in there and see what happens see if my school mistress wants to talk to me again <laughs> that's insane but that's where the history yeah. side comes in it, yes it's, yeah it's it's the, the finding out that the two houses one was the mistresses one was the masters and this was the mistress's house must be deeply gratifying to know you are not insane <laughs> well I'm not sure about that to be quite honest I think a little bit um, but yes, it's it's it kind of it gets me. Even having done this for years, every time something like that happens, and I had it happen again recently on an investigation about something completely different, it gets me here. It, it kind of I get this kind of sick kind of I can't explain this, and but yeah, it made me think I, I, when when they then said to me, "Would you like to write about this place?" That experience made me think I'm supposed to be. Yeah, sounding too bonkers that made me think I'm supposed to be writing about here and you did and tell everybody what the book is called we'll make sure that it's available through the history hack bookshop thank you paranormal playtime the school that never sleeps oh and can I just say on the cover you see the two boys who are on the cover uh-huh that's me too <laughs> <laughs> they're cover stars which when when I first told the older one I was going to use him he's like no you're not uh now he goes around showing it to his friends goes look that's me my mum wrote this that's me um <laughs> the current book I'm writing is a bit different it's on a place called Bosworth Hall in Market Bosworth um got a really interesting history to it um got links to Samuel Johnston people like that um and so I'm talking about that and again Covid has caused a few issues with the investigation side because I'm on a time limit for that one as well um, so I've also talking a bit about the, the Battle of Bosworth Field. Oh, fantastic. Because the book is actually going to be called The Battle for Bosworth, because one of the people who owned Bosworth Hall was a bit of a pugilist and liked to, uh, and a bit of a bully. Ah. And, um, he actually tried to get his wife's sort of lady in waiting arrested and put in jail, supposedly for stealing her clothes because he found out she didn't like the fact that she had married him and thought she could have done better. So there's an awful lot there. And um, it was also where a lady, an amazing lady by the name of Florence Dixie lived, whose brother was the one that got Oscar Wilde taken to court for being a sodomite. Wow. Oh, there, yeah. Lots of tasters for you in that one. In connotations in that one. Penny, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about the new book. It sounds oh, fascinating. Thank you for having me.
When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.